Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for coming to tonight's third on third lecture. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jared, and I'm the curator here at the Amelia Island Museum of History. Now, before we get started today, I would like to ask everyone to silence or turn off their cell phones so we can avoid any interruptions with our speaker. Now, before I turn it over to our speaker, I do a few quick announcements about upcoming events and programs happening at the museum. On September 6th, we'll be having our next brown bag lunch, and our speakers for next month will be Phil Neiman and Dave Roser in the audience here today, who will be teaching us about the history of the U.S. Coast Guard all the way from its early days as a tax collection service to their personal experiences as Coast Guard servicemen in the 20th century. Going along with that, the museum's resuming its Veterans History Project. This project, which we do in uh, partnership with the Library of Congress and Cross the Line Foundation here on the island, collects stories of veterans who live or lived here in Nassau County. If you're interested in participating or know someone who may be, please let me know after the program or reach out. My contact information is on the back table there. One final announcement that I'm very excited to make. Join us on the evening of Friday, September 15th for the opening of the museum's newest temporary exhibit, Fernandina in Fiction. This exhibit takes a look at Fernandina Beach and Amelia Island's appearances in popular books, movies, and other fictional works. Joining us to speak at the event will be local author Joe Palmer, author of A Mariner's Tale, talking to us about Southern fiction and how Amelia Island inspired his book. It'll be an exciting evening, so please join us on the exhibit opening on September 15th. Now finally, I have the honor of introducing our speaker this evening. Dr. Brian earned his PhD at the University of Georgia and is the author of How Curious a Land, Conflict and Change in Green, Green County, Georgia, as well as Dark Places of the Earth, The Voyage of the Slave Ship Antelope. Professor Brian is a devotee of local history and uses it to illustrate issues of universal importance. He's a professor emeritus of history at Georgia Southern University, where he taught American constitutional and legal history. He's also a regular face here at the museum as a volunteer, a docent, and of course, as a lecturer. So if you all will, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Brown. Well, good evening, and that was very nice. I want to thank the museum for letting me uh, speak tonight. Uh, and speaking of speaking, uh, if you can't hear me at any point, let me know. Uh, I can't, can't be heard, right, Thea? Now can I? Is that better? So, uh, yeah, you know what Thea did to me before I came up here tonight? Well, she said, John, we've got some wine there. Why don't you have three or four drinks before you do this? So, uh, no, I didn't have three or four drinks. I did eat a cookie, though, which was quite nice. Thank you, Phyllis. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, I suspect many of you agree with me that we're fortunate to visit or live on this island. Uh, some of my friends here will recognize things, uh, not just because of the beach, uh, though we love the beach and enjoy doing things on it, uh, not just because of the water. This happened just, what was it, a month ago uh, while we were out. Uh, uh, those are, of course, great things, but from a historian's standpoint, uh, Amelia Island and Fernandina is a remarkable place to live. There is such a long and well-documented history here. Uh, Fernandina and Amelia Island are connected to many events, some quite minor and some of very great importance. And so today I'm going to talk about one event that evolved, involved Amelia Island. It's a story of piracy, of the international struggle over the slave trade, uh, of three Supreme Court cases, and of congressional legislation that finally tried to resolve all the mess. It didn't, but um, that's how these things happen. Uh, the Antelope case of 1825 was arguably, I would say without question, uh, the Marshall Court's most important decision on slavery. In fact, the Antelope shaped many following cases that involved slavery, including Dred Scott v. Sanford, which you may be familiar with, and if you're not familiar with that, it directly shaped the Amistad case that was made so famous by Steven Spielberg. So, in Dark Places of the Earth, uh, I tell this story. It's a complicated tale that took me 10 years to unravel. It was a 
uh, uh, the, the, my wife would tell people, John's not here because he's working on the book. And then she would tell people, I can't believe John's not here because he's working on the book. <laughs> and then she would tell people, John's working on the damn book. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's what, what it was like. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit something uh, to you. I, I'm very proud of this book. I won three academic awards. It was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, uh, et cetera. Uh, but I frankly had not read it in years. And I don't know how many of you have tried writing and then picked up something that you wrote years ago, and you go, who wrote this? <laughs> what the, what, what's, why didn't he do this, uh, et cetera. But one thing that came home to me was um, a, a few years ago, an organization called the International Thriller Writers Association asked me to uh, uh, join as a member in their true crime category. And I thought, these guys are nuts. <laughs> I'm writing about constitutional history. Why do they want me to do that? But then I reread the book, and oh my gosh, I had forgotten how many criminal plots surround this case, uh, the, uh, the way people were organizing to try to make what was at the time uh, millions of dollars in ill-gotten gains. Um, anyway. So that's the advertisement, because if you buy the book tonight, all the money goes to the museum. So you'll be supporting the museum uh, for whatever uh, uh, number. If we sell one, okay. If we sell 10, great. If we sell 20, we're out of books. So that's, that's the way to think about it. Um, if you are an e-book reader instead of physical book reader, uh, the book's available on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, and many other online places. Uh, and so I hope that what I do interests you enough uh, to read it. I just heard uh, Coast Guard mentioned. Um, this is a model of the revenue cutter, Dallas. Uh, it was commissioned in 1816. Yeah, you know, 1816, there's no photographs. Everybody understands that, right? Um, and of course, the revenue cutter works within the Revenue Marine Service which to some degree is a predecessor of both uh, United States Customs and United States Coast Guard. Uh, An interesting little ship, only 57 feet long, had one small cannon on a pivot in the center of the ship, and Captain uh, James Jackson with this ship was charged with protecting the southern border of the United States. The southern border of the United States at that time was the St. Mary's River right here wow. next to us. Uh, where you are was Spanish Florida still in 1820. And in fact, despite the fact that it was Spanish Florida, uh, Fernandina was at that time occupied by American troops. Uh, if you need to understand why, come and take a tour of the museum and learn about, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, learn about Gregor McGregor and Louis Array. And then in December of 1817, President James Monroe said, screw this, having these pirates that were on our southern border and sent in um, the Navy and the Army. So um, James Jackson, while he was stationed in Savannah, would spend most of his time at St. Mary's. And while he was in St. Mary's in June of 1820, he began to hear that there was a piratical vessel off of St. Augustine. And this greatly uh, concerned him. Uh, we don't want pirates coming into the United States. Please, by the way, I know in you know, Fernandina we're supposed to really celebrate and enjoy <laughs> pirates, right? But the truth is, if we were passengers on a vessel that's been captured by the pirates, they would just throw us overboard. Goodbye. That's it. Okay? Murderous people who just want to rob and steal. Uh, so he decides he needs to take action. On June 28th, and uh, I don't have a, le anyway, laser pointers don't necessarily work on this. I found that out the hard way. Um, uh, he was stationed here at St. Mary's. He waited for the correct tide and followed the tide down the river because being June 28th, there was very little wind. Just is there any wind today? There was earlier, but 
um, uh, very little wind. He anchored here off the northwest point of Amelia Island, took a boat in to Fernandina. None of this existed, right? To Fernandina, Fort San Carlos, where there were American troops. He borrowed 12 soldiers with all their equipment, came back out to his little 57-foot schooner, loaded them aboard, and then rode the remainder of the tide out. This was the ship channel back then. It's pretty close to the one today, actually. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the sun set, and they floated around in the darkness, waiting. At 7 o'clock the next morning, they saw a strange sail. And so they began to pursue that sail, even though the winds were still light uh, and uh, nobody's going very fast, I guess is the way to put it. As soon as the strange vessel realizes that, uh, that's the Revenue Marine ensign, that the Revenue Marine is coming uh, after them, they turn and sail directly away, and a chase develops that lasts from 7 in the morning until mid-afternoon. By about 2 o'clock, uh, the Dallas had gotten close enough to the vessel that they could see that there were cannons on the deck and that men were rushing around preparing uh, slow matches and windstocks. And obviously, uh, the vessel's going to fight. Uh, Captain Jackson uh, has his cannon prepared, uh, ready to fight. Soon, he's pulled up alongside, as Jackson wrote later, half a pistol shot apart, which I would assume is maybe 10 yards. And uh, at that point, the guys on the other side are hunkered down behind the cannons, and his men are prepared behind their cannons. And uh, the brig that they're chasing suddenly backs its sails to make itself a more stable gun platform. And then the men on the other ship throw down the slow matches and surrender. Oh, wow. An officer on board the ship that, that's just surrendered calls over that they're the Patriot Brig of War, General Ramirez. So what he means by that is, as you probably know, a host of different Latin American revolutions erupted uh, 1810 and after throughout uh, the Spanish, huge Spanish empire that existed in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the main reason for that was uh, Napoleon realized his brother Joseph needed a job, and he decided, well, being king of Spain is a good job. So I'm not making this up. I'm really not. So they, uh, Joseph uh, uh, and, and Napoleon invaded uh, Spain in 1808. Uh, the Spanish government began to fall apart. Ultimately, by 1810, it was besieged in the city of Cadiz. And there was no way they could manage their global empire uh, in, when they're fighting literally to, to survive. And uh, so pretty soon, people in the global empire say, we don't need the Spanish administrators anyway, do we? And you get these Latin American revolutions. What these Latin American revolutionaries were doing is giving, um, uh, uh, how would I put it, privateer commissions is perhaps the best way to explain it. Uh, letters of mark, it's called in our Constitution. Uh, but privateer commissions uh, to various private ship owners, allowing them to attack and capture the vessels of their enemy. And then these vessels can be brought into the correct admiralty court, condemned, and ka-ching, you make a bunch of money. So privateering is a very popular thing uh, of, among uh, people. Uh, the General Ramirez claims to be a privateer of the Banda Oriental, uh, which is uh, led by a guy named Jose Artecas. Uh, it's a predecessor to modern Uruguay. Its capital was in Montevideo. In fact, if you visit Montevideo today, you'll find the Central Square has a vast mausoleum devoted to Artigas. In reality, Artigas didn't do so well, but that's a different story. Uh, Latin America is an interesting place. Jay could tell us all about that. So. Um, not sure, but suspecting, probably by the stench. Uh, uh, Captain Jackson sent his first officer, 
over to uh, the captured ship, the General Ramirez, and what they found, the first officer reported, were 281 African Negroes and the bodies of two others who were dead lying on the deck. This is a, uh, uh, not the, am uh, not the uh, uh, antelope, the General Ramirez is of course the antelope under a different name. This is not the antelope, but a very similar vessel that was captured in 1822, uh, depicting what it's like to have 300 people loaded aboard a vessel of this size. So you have some idea. John, and, yes? I hate to interrupt, but if you took pointer, there's a wooden pointer back there that you help with the TV. On the wall. There you go. We're, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a nun, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, um, uh, what do you do? So we'll leave Captain Jackson contemplating what to do with this horrible discovery. And by the way, you know, this is a nice presentation, right? That's probably closer to how it really looks, right? Everybody's naked, everybody is, they, they find, everybody is starved and dehydrated. The ship is out of food and water, uh, a terrible situation. So where the heck did this ship come from? How, how had this happened? Well, to figure that out, we have to go to Havana. In Havana, uh, uh, a, uh, a merchant firm, Santiago de la Cuesta, uh, is the principal of the firm, uh, has been trading in slaves for many years. In fact, the antelope has made two previous successful slaving voyages to Africa. And this was the third voyage had been sent on by this firm. Um, wh what had happened, it's interesting, uh, what had happened to Cuba is up until the late 1700s, it was not a particularly productive colony. But beginning at that time, sugar and coffee production took off, not tobacco, although they did grow it there. Uh, sugar and coffee production took off. It began to grow dramatically. Uh, reforms in the uh, uh, Spanish monarchy allowed ever greater trade, which in particular included trade in enslaved people. And so uh, uh, if you went to Cuba in 1790, you would have found about 40,000 enslaved people on the island. If you went there in 1820, you would have found more than 250,000 enslaved people on the island. You get the idea. Enslaved people are pouring in, and this continues all the way until 1866. So the vessel was fitted out. I give details about that in the book. It's pretty interesting to me, at least. And uh, then it departed Havana in the summer of 1819, uh, traveling across the Atlantic probably following a route like this, up with the Gulf Stream, across with the westerlies, south, and ultimately the ship reached Cabinda, which is here on the coast of, of Central Africa, just north of the mouth of the Congo River. So here's the Bay of Cabinda and the Congo River. Um, again, I, I detail in the book how trading works there, excuse me, how trading works there, the way you accumulate people. We tend to think in terms of uh, going to the grocery store, right? You, you drive up, boom, you load up with your enslaved folks, and uh, you take off to go sell them. But it didn't work like that. You bought people in uh, little dribbles here, and little dribbles there, five one day, six the next day, as you slowly loaded your vessel. So you actually had uh, captives on board your vessel, sometimes for months before you actually left to make that middle passage uh, across the Atlantic. This is a uh, watercolor from 1853 of Cabinda. Uh, were I to show you a picture of Cabinda today, what you would see is incredible pollution, a huge oil refinery, and uh, a lot of uh, vessels loading oil. Here. It's become one of the big oil producing uh, areas of the world. But back then, uh, Europeans described it as a, a bucolic place with beautiful uh, uh, savannas and palm trees and all of these other sorts of things. But not so beautiful for those who are captives and being loaded on the antelope. 
again, I beg your indulgence. We're going to now, you know, you do on TV, back at the ranch or whatever. Um, we have to follow the story of another ship, the Columbia, which is later renamed, renamed the Arianta. And to do that, we have to go to Baltimore. Um, the Araganta, the Columbia, was a privateering vessel that had been sailing with a commission from Venezuela, right, who was in rebellion against Spain. And that meant that you could capture uh, Spanish vessels and take them into a Venezuelan port and sell whatever the, the vessel was worth, including whatever its cargo was worth, even if the cargo was human beings, and make a lot of money. And Simon Metcalf, who was the captain of, uh, uh, of the Columbia, had become rich doing this. He came to Baltimore to provision his ship for a new voyage and to round up new sailors for this, which he did. And then they departed uh, in December of 1819. Um, the ship, by the way, is described long, lean, fast, uh, and what they called a hermaphrodite brig rig, which uh, meant square sails on the foremast, the front mast, and then a scooter rig on the, on the main mast or the after mast there. Um, and this is the rig of a, 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 I mean, this is a predator, if you follow me. This boat can go faster to windward than a ship with square sails, and going downwind, it has just as much ability to go as a ship with square sails. In fact, later it's created and it's made into the brigantine, if you've ever heard of that rig. Uh, it's a little different, but nonetheless. Um, the Columbia leaves uh, Baltimore, it crosses the Atlantic. They go to the Cape Verde Islands, uh, where uh, they spend some time, uh, for <coughs> no reason that they could figure out among the crew, uh, shelling Portuguese forts there, just for fun. And uh, then they continue on and they begin to capture ships. They ultimately have captured three slave vessels here in the Bight of Benin uh, when they are uh, rounded up by a British warship on an anti-slavery patrol. Uh, they're taken into Sierra Leone, uh, accused of being pirates, but then, again, you've got to read the book. Um, <laughs> they're released. And so, uh, they're told not to go south of the line, which means not to go south of the equator. Uh, immediately, they sail south of the equator, <laughs> and they end up uh, at Cabinda, where they find uh, the antelope and two other vessels loading uh, captives to take into slavery. Uh, they capture all of them, uh, and then Simon Metcalf puts his first officer, John Smith, isn't that a good name for a pirate? <laughs> John Smith, uh, in command of the Antelope, the brig, and they set off across the Atlantic headed for Brazil. Um, off the coast of Brazil, <coughs> the Columbia is wrecked. Simon Metcalf is last seen floating away, clinging to parts of the wreckage. And that's the end of Simon Metcalf. And suddenly John Smith is left with a vessel with more than 300 captives on board and no clue what Metcalf's connections were in Brazil through which he hoped to sell uh, these captives. So he turns north. Uh, the Antelope alone sails. This about here is where uh, the... Columbia was wrecked. First, Smith checks in at Suriname, a, a Dutch colony that at this time was growing and demanding more and more enslaved people. But two of his sailors desert and betray his purposes there, so he has to leave. He then sails to St. Martin. He sails to St. Bart's. Uh, in St. Bart's, he meets a mysterious Mr. Mason, who have evidently cut some sort of deal. And they leave St. Bart's and sell sailed directly to the Bahamas, 
We're here at what was then called Hole in the Wall, on the very southern point of Great Abateau Island. Um, what it was, a long limestone wall, natural wall, that went out to the ocean, and the ocean had carved a round hole through it. And so this was a well-known rendezvous because the Providence Channel here was the main way to cut through uh, to pick up the Gulf Stream or to go to Florida. Uh, there they rendezvoused with Mr. Mason. He took some money from the antelope. He uh, gave them some uh, cannons and some other supplies. Uh, and then about that time, uh, a small schooner came by and the antelope stopped it, acting like a privateer. And on board that schooner was Cornelio Coppinger, who happened to be the son of the Spanish governor of Florida. Snatching Coppinger, uh, then Smith has a great idea. I'm going to go to St. Augustine and use my control of this young man to force them to buy my captives. He gets to St. Augustine. Uh, he uh, asks for permission to sell the captives. The governor says, no way, in hell. Uh, and then he says, well, Governor, I have your son, and uh, we'll hang him if you don't uh, 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 let us sell our captives. And the governor replies, basically, I don't deal with pirates hanging. <laughs> I always wondered how that made the son feel. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, it doesn't work. Uh, it's an interesting thing, as I point out in the book. Uh, this is a man who's cruel enough in his transatlantic voyage to have more than 50 of these captives die from dehydration, from starvation, from disease, and yet he's too kind-hearted to hurt Cornelio Coffin. He lets him go. And then he turns north. This is the piratical vessel that Jackson had heard about, and boom, it's captured. So Jackson decides we best take this boat in and let the courts figure out what's going on. Uh, they come back into the St. Mary's River. Uh, they take the ship up here uh, near Point Peter, which is uh, where there was a U.S. fort at that time. Uh, anchor it. He takes the crew and the captain and sails to Savannah, where they are locked in the jail, and where the U.S. Marshal there, uh, Marshal Morrell, says, yeah, bring me the captain. He comes back to get the captives. Remember 281? He finds that nine captives have died and 14 are just missing. He starts to suspect maybe his first officer sold some of those 14 ashore, right? Uh, remember, this is the legacy of the Coast Guard, sorry. <laughs> Actually, Jackson runs the guy out of the service because of his suspicions. So uh, he doesn't get away with it completely. And then he takes the antelope up to Savannah. Uh, this is a depiction of Savannah in 1819, close enough, right? And uh, in Savannah, they come to uh, the central dock here at the foot uh, of the bluff. Uh, people in Savannah know the story because the uh, 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 officers and men have been interviewed at length by the newspaper. They're all expecting, wow, 280 new captives. Savannah was in terrible financial condition at this point, and uh, they thought, this is going to rescue us financially. Uh, and then the ship begins to unload, and the captives are children. Yeah, this is also a child abuse story. Okay. Um, 85% are uh, under age 20, 41% are under age 10. Uh, they are uh, dehydrated, uh, they are starved, uh, they are sick. <coughs> the United States Marshal, Marshal Morrell, who everyone talks about as being a really hard man, was apparently devastated by the condition of these captives. He wrote to President James Monroe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I basically I'm clearly emotionally overwhelmed by this. Uh, he had planned for the captives to leave their landing place 
and march here and out this road, the Louisville Road, uh, to where the uh, city horse racing track was. Uh, none of these children were going to be able to march anywhere. So we had to gather together wagons. They rode the children out there, uh, everybody out there, and they housed them in the stables. Uh, they were naked. Uh, it's July of 1820. It does there what it does here in the middle of the summer. It rains like all get out every day, more than an inch of rain each day. Uh, the uh, racetrack turns into a quagmire. After they're there 10 days, they finally round up blankets for the children. And I must admit, I've had haunting visions of little star children wrapped in muddy blankets, sloshing through uh, this to go sleep in a, uh, in, in a horse stall. So, um, and then, I mean, you can't, you can't make this stuff up, guys. Because just a week before the antelope arrived, Dr. William Waring had sufficiently to himself confirmed that there was yellow fever in Savannah. Uh, and Dr. Waring uh, tried to let the authorities know. Other doctors also began to diagnose yellow fever. Uh, everyone ignored it. You don't want to say you have yellow fever in your city because that causes everyone to flee. Commerce closes down. It's the, the source of an economic disaster. The mayor again and again says there is no sickness in Savannah. This is just part of the death registers. Uh, fever, 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 I'm sorry, I know you can't see it back there. Um, more than a thousand people die in Savannah of yellow fever. Uh, the city is completely depopulated as those with any brains flee. Uh, and uh, the antelope captives, of course, are not able to flee. We don't know who died from what. They didn't bother to, in fact, even here, uh, they just estimated that, well, we don't know, but between 200 and 500 enslaved people in Savannah died. But they didn't keep up with it. Those people were just thrown into a common grave, right? I mean, they're only slaves. Um, they didn't keep data on what happened to cause the death among the antelope captives. What we do know is 258 came off the ship in July and that in January there were 212 left alive. So, but remember we started with 331 probably, so we're whittling it down fast, to say the least. Um, John Smith had been allowed, he, he somehow, he had $500 in his sea chest, but somehow he was able to pay a $5,000 uh, bail. And then he was allowed to leave the city because of the, uh, of the yellow fever. Remember, there's no fingerprints, there's no photographs, there's no way for them to really identify somebody, right? No, I'm, I'm George Jackson, what the heck are you talking to me about? Uh, and uh, he, he went to Baltimore, and then to everyone's astonishment in December, he showed back up in Savannah. Uh, he's charged with piracy. <laughs> No political comment intended, but we've seen lots of that indictments lately. <laughs> the United States versus John Smith, indictment, piracy under the law of nations. Okay, if you're convicted, they hang you. In fact, they just finished hanging two pirates in Savannah just before this. Uh, so why the hell would he come back? What on earth is going on? Well, one reason was he shows up in federal court and he has the dream team of lawyers. One of his attorneys is John McPherson Berry, who's not only sitting Superior Court Judge of Georgia, he uh, later will become United States Senator from Georgia and ultimately Attorney General of the United States. Nice to have that guy on your side. Uh, the other guy is James Moore Wayne, who is the sitting judge of the Court of Common Pleas in Savannah, and who later in his career will become a justice of the United States Supreme Court. Okay, again, not bad to have on your team. Uh, in fact, there are three sitting judges in Savannah. All three are in this courtroom. Judge, uh, judge Davies running the trial, and the two other judges defending 
uh, the defendant. And there's a host of other things that go on. Again, you've got to read the book. <laughs> and John Smith, we find the defendant, John Smith, not guilty. No. Right? He's not guilty of this. All right? Now, the other legal action that's going on is in the Admiralty Court, and it's the fight over who owns these captives, who even in their reduced numbers are still worth a fortune. There's no other way to put it. Uh, the Spanish vice consul in town has claimed the captives for uh, Cuesta Manzanal, Yermano, the, the, the firm that owned the antelope. Uh, and uh, uh, he claims 130. Uh, the Portuguese vice consul doesn't have anybody who he can show owns anything here, but he claims 150 for the Portuguese. Uh, John Jackson, remember, the captain of the revenue cutter, John Jackson claims either salvage, which means to get a piece of the value of the cargo that he has rescued, or a bounty that the US government is offering for captives who are freed from the slave trade and returned to Africa 25 bucks a head. Um, a lot better if he gets the salvage, it comes out at 75 bucks a head. All right? And then uh, John Smith, the no not convicted pirate, no. says, I'm a legitimate privateer. I was under the flag of the Banda Oriental. They belong to me. And then to everyone's astonishment, the United States Attorney for the District of Georgia, Richard Wiley Haversham, comes into the courtroom and says, no, these people are not property to be divided. They are free people under American law. They are to be returned to Africa. The United States, even though he has to make the claim in the name of the United States, are the mere nominal claimant. The Negroes are the actual party. An astonishing thing, he's from one of the Savannah's, uh, well, I mean, if you live in Georgia, you know there's Habersham's everywhere, right? Um, uh, he's one of the leading families in Savannah, no, no question about it. Uh, and uh, he's a slave owner. Uh, his cousin uh, is one of the biggest slave owners in Georgia. Uh, but uh, throughout this case, Habersham continues to fight at every turn to try to free these people so that they are not enslaved. Uh, it, it, there's a big question, how do you explain that? Uh, and uh, I would explain it this way. Um, Habersham was a member of what was called the American Colonization Society. This was an organization set up involving people like Habersham, involving the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall, and many other leading American politicians and businessmen to create a colony in West Africa to which free blacks could be sent. Uh, for many of the southern slaveholders, this was a great idea. It resolves the problem of what do we do about free black people living in our society. And as you have racialized slavery at this time, and you legitimate slavery through your assumptions about what race means people are like, right, which is what they did. Uh, racialization is something that's actually happened fairly recently in terms of culture. Um, then we're able to get these potentially problematic people out of American society. Uh, you have both people who are abolitionists and those who own slaves but want to get free black people out of America in this organization. If the antelope captives are returned to Africa, they're not going to be taken back to Cabinda and potentially their homes in Congo or wherever it was uh, that they had originated, they're going to be instead taken to Liberia, a mere 1,500 nautical miles from Cabinda, where they have been loaded on board ship. And thus, they will become colonists in what is actually at this time a struggling colony that cannot attract people to live there because going to Liberia means you die. Okay? Judge Davies says, no way, Jose. 
only when the different governments of the civilized world have abolished the trade will I consider the claims in favor of the Africans. Uh, uh, Davies is in on it, by the way. Um, they do divide things up. They meet in the Savannah Exchange Building. They had testimony that 25 people had been taken from an American vessel. That American vessel, therefore, was trading illegally. And that means, in Davies' interpretation, that those people should be free, right? But then he reduces it by what he thinks is the average loss and comes up with seven captives to be freed. And he's thinking, yeah, Habersham, see, you got seven free. You, you succeeded. You, you don't have to worry about this anymore. And then he gives 142 to the Portuguese and 63 to the Spanish. Now, no one has shown up saying, yeah, I own the Portuguese ship these guys were taken from. No one has entered any proof that they somehow represent the Portuguese and have this. And in fact, uh, uh, Judge Davies, after this decision, resigns as judge and goes into partnership with John McPherson Berrien so that he can share in the loot uh, from, I'm not making this up, he can share in the loot, I mean, anyway. And that's the total of 212 living captives. So what happens to them? Habersham immediately says, I'm appealing to United States Circuit Court. So what are we going to do with the captives? The littlest ones are distributed to the best families in Savannah and put to work uh, as the equivalent of house slaves, although at law they're not slaves. More than 100 go out to the U.S. Marshall's Plantation, Cottingham Plantation, out on Brian Neck, and uh, live with and work with the enslaved people already out there. And Morrell, as we discover, is getting rich out of this. By 1822, he brags that he's making $30,000 a year off of this free labor. And at the same time, he's charging the United States Navy for their care. Up to that point, he'd already gotten more than $20,000. I don't know if you know, $50,000 in 1822 is huge sum. We're talking two and a half, three million dollars in today's terms. That's why we're fighting over this so much. I, I think you guys understand. Um, in uh, the circuit court, it's supposed to be the district court judge and the Supreme Court justice who has that circuit who sit. But remember, Davies had resigned so he could join with John McPherson Berry and make money. Uh, and so Supreme Court Justice William Johnson sat alone. And he said, no, seven's too few to go free. It should be 16. <laughs> and how, right, I know, it's like they're just pulling it. It's even worse. It's not just pulling that number out of the hat. Then he said, how do we determine which 16? God will guide the hand as they engage in a lottery. All right? So you're going to line everybody up, make them engage in a lottery in which 16 lucky people are going to go free. And then uh, he says, uh, the laws of any country, this means the United States laws against the slave trade, on the subject of the slave trade are nothing more than the trade laws of the nation that made them, can't affect a Spanish ship, can't affect a Portuguese ship, because they still allow the slave trade. And so Habersham literally leaps up in the courtroom and says, I'm appealing to the Supreme Court. And meanwhile, the captives are still living in the Savannah area. They're still being treated as though enslaved. They're still working for nothing. And Morrell is con continuing to accumulate even more bills that he's going to send to the United States government for their care uh, while they're there working. Uh, very, very interesting story. The appeal comes to uh, Washington, D.C. At that time, this is the, how the Capitol looked in 1821. Right here is where the Supreme Court chambers were. And these three windows are those three windows there. Okay? Uh, it's a small room. Uh, contemporaries say it's like going down into a basement to do justice. Uh, it's it's winter time when they hold their sessions there, and these windows face north. Uh, 
And so there's very little natural light. Uh, you're instead relying on oil lamps that can sometimes be smoky, etc. You're getting an idea for the scene, right? This is what it's like uh, in, in the Supreme Court chambers. Uh, uh, Haverstam was actually prepared to send a letter to John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, and said, I'm all ready to go. You know, as soon as this case comes before the court, I'll be glad to argue it. And as it happened throughout this case, he gets no reply from John Quincy Adams. In fact, he even at one point writes Adams uh, essentially in a critical way, saying, because you've given me no guidance, we've ended up with this case going to the Supreme Court. So, and Adams doesn't respond uh, to that. The case sits on the docket. Back then, there was no right of sociari. Right of sociari. Uh, every case that was legitimate that came to the Supreme Court was supposed to be heard. The case sat on the docket in 1822. Nothing happened. 1823, nothing happened. 1824, nothing happened. And then Francis Scott Key, another member of this American Colonization Society, who would like more settlers for Liberia and Africa, finds out about the case and uses his connections, which he has many. Here, we think of him as some you know, poet dreamily writing the, 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 right, the, the song we all sing before baseball games. Um, in reality, he was considered one of the premier appellate attorneys in Washington, DC, and was an extraordinarily wealthy and well-respected man. And he had connections. And he used his connections, I'm convinced, I don't have a letter saying, I used my connections, but I'm convinced he used his connections to make sure the case came before the Supreme Court. So in 1825, uh, the Supreme Court hears the Antelope case, by the way, for the first time. There's going to be two more. Uh, here, it's a lot of money they're fighting over. Uh, he hears the Antelope case for the first time. Uh, uh, Francis Scott Key is joined by the United States Attorney General William Wirt, who is often one of the most experienced appellate attorneys in American history, uh, the longest serving Attorney General in American history. Uh, uh, they uh, are arguing for the captive's freedom. And Francis Scott Key, each person, their arguments are so convoluted each of the four attorneys who are there are going to argue for an entire day. Nowadays, you get 30 minutes. Uh, but that's how they could do it back then. Uh, he argues for an entire day, in essence, talking to six sitting justices. One guy was sick and not able to be there. Six sitting justices, four of whom are slave owners, right? arguing that by the law of nature, all men are free arguing that under the laws of the United States, these captives are free, arguing that under international law, these captives are free. Uh, very emotional, very powerful. In fact, word had spread through Washington, D.C. about this case. And so that little bitty chamber was packed. Because in the winter time in 1825, in Washington, D.C., there wasn't a damn thing to do. <laughs> so why not go and hear an interesting case, right? Uh, next, John McPherson Berrien, who was involved with this case from the beginning, who had gotten uh, 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 um, John Smith off, who had represented uh, uh, Captain Jackson, uh, who there are letters, literally I found some of these in, uh, of all places, he went to Princeton, but of all places, some of his letters that are the most damning are at Harvard. Uh, and so I found these letters there where he's literally conspiring with people about this case. I'm not making this up. Again, you've got to read the book. Um, and he's a United States Senator by this time, and will soon be Attorney General of the United States. Uh, but uh, he just ridicules Key's argument. Basically, what a soft-hearted fool he must be, right? Would it become the United States to assume the character of censors of the morals to the world? In other words, we can't decide this on morality. We can't decide this on sentiment. We have to decide it 
Jared Ingersoll makes kind of an argument for uh, the Portuguese claimants, and he's, he's got the burden of still no Portuguese claimant has actually shown up, all right? So he's not, it's not like Varian who's representing a known Spanish firm claiming these people. And then William Wirt, the Attorney General, argues, and this is kind of interesting, although he hedges. Remember, he's, these guys are politicians. He hedges. The Africans are parties to the cause. Well, you can only be parties if you are free, right? So, oops, but at least some uh, such of them as are free. Got a hedge. Got a hedge. And then everybody goes away. So, these guys are busy at the court all the time. Uh, and and, and you know, they're in this room a lot, listening to cases. Back then, it took a long time to set things up and type and print them. So opinions were not something that were published and you found out about them. Literally, when an opinion was done, the justices came in, and before the case began today, John Marshall would read the opinion aloud from the bench. And so both Francis Scott Key and William Wirt happened to be in the Supreme Court chambers when suddenly Marshall picks up the handwritten opinion and begins to read it. And before long, according to uh, Francis Scott Key, he, he said he had a sinking feeling in his stomach. In examining claims of this momentous importance, claims in which the sacred rights of liberty and property come into conflict with each other, this court must not yield to feelings which might seduce it from the path of duty and must obey the mandate of the law. I think everybody here now knows what happened in the decision. Okay. He finds that uh, 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 the, except for the few who'd already been sent off to Liberia, the, the 16, who by the way disappear, uh, 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 the rest are to be returned to their claimants. Except this is John Marshall. John Marshall must have loved uh, the Book of Kings in the Bible because he's always trying to be Solomon cutting the baby in half. You guys know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then he says, talking about the Portuguese claim, these vessels were plundered in March of 1820 and libel was filed in August of the same year. From that time to this, a period of more than five years, no subject of the crown of Portugal has appeared to assert title to this property. This inattention to a subject of such interest, this total disregard of valuable property, is so contrary to the course of human action as to justify serious suspicion that the real owner dares not avow himself. And then he goes on from there basically saying, I understand what's going on with the Portuguese claim. It's a criminal conspiracy by all those guys in Savannah and I'm not going to allow it. Instead, the Portuguese portion are free and are being returned to Africa. Okay. Well, for John McPherson Berrien, this was a disaster. He'd made a secret deal with the Portuguese that uh, he thought the Portuguese, because they were claiming more, would end up getting more of the captives. And so he made a secret deal that whatever comes out, we're going to split everything 50-50. Now, he is the person who only gets uh, a portion of the captives, about 35% of the surviving captives at this moment, and he has to give half of them to the Portuguese, who, you know, he knows it's, it's bogus. It's just people in Savannah who, who funded this. So, what do you do? I'll let you read the book and find <laughs> out. <laughs> so I would go back. See, you should have given me that one. Um, why, why we go back to the Supreme Court a second time in 1826, a third time in 1827, where basically Justice Trimble says, we're tired of this. Stop coming to us. We already made the decision. And so then finally in 1828, 120 survivors, including some children who'd been born since, the captives arrived in Georgia are sent to Liberia. 
And in Liberia, they are, uh, go outside of uh, uh, the capital, Monrovia, named for James Monroe, and they create a settlement of New Georgia. Interestingly, uh, the most common, these people got to choose surnames because they're free, so they got to choose last names. And overwhelmingly, the most common last name they chose was Harrison. As you can understand, the guy who fought for their freedom all the way through. The 39 who ended up being enslaved and kept in the United States through another corrupt deal end up owned by a United States congressman from Georgia, Richard Henry Wild, and by the congressional delegate from Florida, Richard White. Uh, and they are building a new plantation called Casa Bianca. Uh, ultimately, they make so much money that William Henry Wild resigns from Congress, goes off to Florence, and writes really bad poetry. <laughs> he comes back and takes a position as a law professor at Tulane, gets yellow fever, and dies. But, but uh, uh, this is Casa Bianca before it was struck by lightning in the early 20th century and burned down. And these guys are going hunting. And here's an African American man here. And here's an African American man here. And I always wonder are they descendants of the antelope captives? Thank you very much. You were really appreciate it. And I can take questions, or you can just go away like my students would. You know. <laughs> That's what students do. I guess about five minutes before class is over. Thank you all so much for coming. Yes. service came and said, I need a dozen men to help me take a pirate vessel that I think may be coming north. They don't know that it's slave trade. I don't know where the hell John Smith thought he was headed. Okay? John Smith had uh, a, um, uh, a commission from Louis R.A. from years before. And, but I'm sure he knew that that regime here on Amelia Island was over, right? Well, our ray had been chased away, Americans had occupied the island, and then we stayed occupying it because we didn't want our ray or somebody like him coming back. So I'm sure he, he had to know that, but there's part of me that says, well, maybe he thinks he can still slip them in at Bernardino. Maybe he thinks that. It's still legal. It's still legal, exactly. But you have the problem of you are in a stolen Spanish ship showing up in uh, a Spanish, I mean, that's why they're not going to Cuba, right? Cuba, the Cubans quickly figure it out, hang them all. So, uh, uh, but maybe that's where he was going when they caught him off of Amelia. That was one of the big arguments in the court case, was he wasn't caught off the coast of the United States. He was caught off the coast of San Florida, and therefore you, Captain John Jackson, had no jurisdiction to grab it. Well, if you're in the Bahamas and the uh, 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 Coast Guard comes to your vessel, don't argue with them about jurisdiction. <laughs> it's that simple. It's a good question. Yes. in the water right now. Um, <laughs> at least that's what we think, right? If you go out and get back to the plaza and over, yeah. 
And as long as you're not feeding the insects, you'll have time to stand around and read a new <laughs> historical marker that's great that's there about the slave trade, by the way. But uh, uh, in front of that plaza was where Fort San Carlos was. It was no big deal. It had four cannons. Okay? And in fact, during the, the Patriot War, when it was attacked, uh, they, they figured out they didn't have any cannons that could fire in. They just had a block house with some guys with muskets in it. And so the Patriots were very easily able to capture Fort San Carlos. Uh, was it improved from 1812 to, to 1820 by the time the Americans were there? Probably. But um, there's, you know, there's bricks and other things people say may be part of it in the water right there. <clears throat> but I think it's mostly washed away. It's kind of like Fort Caroline on the St. John's River. It's gone. They dredged it and created a much bigger current there, and it's washed away. And most uh, uh, archaeologists will tell you. That's why when you go to the Fort Caroline the National Monument, you see a fake Fort, Fort Caroline that they built there. And the only thing we know for sure is that's not the Fort Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you all very much.